State Senator Diana DeZogli is our guest this morning. Let's go on the record. A rising star on Beacon Hill, outspoken on issues of equality and fairness. Now a candidate for auditor. Can she take her message statewide? The senator joins us right now on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Welcome to OTR on this July 4th. I'm Ed Harding along with New Surprise political reporter Janet Wu. Great to have you with us and hope you are enjoying the holiday weekend. And sitting at the round table with us this morning is our guest, State Senator Diana DeZogler. She's a Democrat representing the 1st Essex District. Hello. She is from Methuen. She's a graduate of Wellesley College. And in 2022, she is a candidate for state auditor. So it's great to see you. Thanks for being here this holiday weekend. It's great to kick off the weekend with you. Thanks Thank you. for having me in, Ed and Janet. It's great to be here. Happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July to you as well. So you're the um, first person, or I should say the only announced candidate for state auditor right now. Um, you won your first district race, what was it, eight years ago? And But you were a legislative aide before that, so it was, you're not new to Beacon Hill in that sense, but you say you're ready for your first statewide race. So my question to you is, why now, why auditor? Thank you so much, great question. So I ran for office for the first time, actually, a little over 10 years ago, and it was actually after a pretty tumultuous situation on Beacon Hill. I was a legislative staffer, uh, as you were just referring to. I had actually, on Beacon Hill during that time, uh, experienced some sexual harassment, was dismissed from my position, and the former Speaker of the House at the time thought that the appropriate way to deal with that situation was by giving me a non-disclosure agreement to silence me about the harassment, discrimination, and abuse that was taking place on Beacon Hill. I subsequently decided to run for office about a year later. I knocked on every door in my district and was successful, humbled and honored at the opportunity. I took the position of state representative in 2012 and 13 very seriously, started to advocate for transparency and accountability measures, fighting for rules reform in the House of Representatives, and then subsequently during our uh, sexual harassment reform policy debate, when the Me Too movement hit, I uh, actually got up, was able to fight for reforms to non-disclosure agreements on Beacon Hill to create greater transparency and accountability regarding the issues on Beacon Hill and across our state. Subsequently ran for state senator after that. I am coming in on my 10th year in the legislature. Uh, it's a very exciting time. I have been, again, humbled at the opportunity to be able to serve my community in the way that I've been able to and look at the state auditor seat as a way that I can continue the work on transparency, accountability, and creating greater accessibility on Beacon Hill and across our state government on a statewide platform. Now, you um, you brought up the thing about the non-disclosure agreement. We'll talk a little bit more about the issue itself later. But since you've brought it up, I want to know, you, were not, you didn't have to sign the NDA. You decided to sign the NDA so that you could get a lump sum of money, right? Uh, is that correct? Uh, at the time, I was making about a $30,000 a year salary from the State House, and in order to collect a six week severance package upon my dis dismissal due to the sexual harassment, uh, the Speaker required that I sign a non disclosure agreement. Uh, that was taxpayer funded, and it was just for that six week severance package. It was not uh, a settlement or anything like mm -hmm. that. It was mm -hmm. a severance package. But you had no, you, you felt like you had no choice. You had to do it. Oh, certainly. My car had just broken down. I had just graduated from Wellesley. I, it was my first job out of college, and uh, I, I don't come from a family of great wealth. I'm uh, from the city of Methuen, lived in Lawrence for several years when I was a kid, born to a 17 year old single mom. So, yes. I did feel the need to take the six-week severance so, and sign that NDA. So, so, so being, and, and as Jenna said, we're going we're gonna to circle back to that in a bit, but, but, but focus it back on auditor. Being auditor, to, if you were to become auditor, why do you want to be the state auditor? Well, as everybody at home knows, it's really uh, challenging to get access to information about what's happening on Beacon Hill, and power is very centralized. We call what happens on Beacon Hill democratic in nature. We say, you know, that there's a democratic legislative process happening. But in my nearly 10 years of experience on the Hill as an elected, I can tell you that there's nothing democratic about the process right now. A lot of things are done behind closed doors. A lot of issues are already decided before mm -hmm. people in our communities know about them. And I have been championing transparency and accountability regarding that process over the course of the last 10 years. But uh, you know, it's, it's been in a way that's been being done from outside of the room where all of the big kids, so to speak, are sitting at the table. You have about three to five people really making these decisions and the rest of the legislature sort of banging at the door trying to get in. As state auditor, I would be able to 
be independent as a constitutional officer, answer to the people, take the concerns about that transparency and accountability about how taxpayer dollars are being spent and processes that need to be fixed, and I would be able to investigate and audit those processes. If, 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 you, if you did win, what would you do? If you have a first, do you have a one, two, three, four lineup already? One, I'm going to do this first, this second, this third, this fourth. Certainly, and we'll start with what I just mentioned. I know, I know that non-disclosure agreements are non being used across agreement. state government still using the tax dollars of all of those who are sitting at home watching this show mm -hmm. right now. They are being used to silence people across not just Beacon Hill but across state government municipal government I want to do a deep dive as state auditor into how much has been spent to cover up abuse in our government and potential corruption in our government secondly I would like to look at uh, we know about the Holyoke Soldiers Home issue and the tragedy that happened there with 77 veterans lost their lives. We know that the governor came before a legislative committee recently and that he was not forthcoming about knowing the superintendent for the nursing home. And we saw what? We saw mistruths told. I'm calling for right now as a state senator for the governor to come before us again under oath this time and for the Senate to utilize their full subpoena authority to get to the bottom of that. But we haven't yet done that. So as state auditor, I plan to do a deep dive into that. And the third thing, Ed, uh, because you asked, is we know that during the pandemic, we had a tremendously tough time with the vaccine rollout here in Massachusetts and finally got it together after a couple of months. But we know that during the vaccine distribution process, the administration, instead of sending the millions in taxpayer dollars that was supposed to accompany vaccines uh, coming into our local communities, our cities and towns to distribute vaccines to our elderly, immunocompromised, those without transportation, uh, those with disabilities, those vaccines were sent instead to these mass vaccination sites where a lot of people couldn't get access to them. And mm -hmm. what followed those vaccines was millions of dollars in taxpayer, millions in taxpayer dollars. I would like to know why those dollars went to those private companies instead of to our cities and towns. And I want to know why they were given out with no bid contracts that had no RFPs. There's a lot to dissect here right. or to pull apart, but I want to go back to the soldiers um, hold the soldiers home. Um, you criticized the governor for firing the veterans secretary who is a Lawrence or one of your constituents. Mm -hmm. I, my question is why would not the top of the cabinet who is responsible for that home not be responsible for what happened and you said you basically said that he was a scapegoat uh, and that there were people below him that were responsible. But if you're the head of the cabinet, shouldn't you be responsible for what happened there? And I can't speak to the governor's relationship with the head of you know anything that is under the jurisdiction of anybody. That's for the governor to speak to. What I do know is that the secretary was scapegoated and it, it did fall completely on his shoulders and that the governor did come before a legislative committee and not tell the truth. And that's what I'm calling out. I'm calling out the mistruth. So you're not saying spoken. that he should have been, not been fired. That's not what you're saying. I am saying that I think that the governor does owe the Secretary of Veteran Services an apology for scapegoating him and for saying that he never met the superintendent who was directly overseeing the soldier's home. And a question about another legislative um, inquiry into this whole thing. Uh, there's been, there have been several. It looks like no one's willing really to do anything. Do you really think that another investigation will change anything at this point? I think that since the governor didn't have to testify under oath that there was a greater uh, ability to forget information, and that's what he said, right? He said that he forgot that he had actually met, interviewed, and sworn in Bennett Walsh. I think that that is very disappointing to hear from uh, the person who is in charge of this entire state, and I think that we have to use the tool belt, the tool, the tools that are in our tool belt, right, Janet? So. In our tool belt, we have the tool in the Senate of using our subpoena authority and requiring testimony under oath. And I believe that if the governor comes back under those circumstances, we might get a different story. There, might, there, also, there is also the question, if you meet someone for just a few minutes and the governor does meet a lot of people, there is the possibility that he was not lying at that point. And if we get him under oath, we can find those things out.